Mike, tell us about um, this uh, helicopter that you flew in Vietnam. It's uh, called a CH-46, and that's the A model, and, uh, which is what I flew in Nam. Um, it was the Marine Corps' medium helicopter. The uh, Marine used that like the Army used the Huey. We did just about everything with that. We did uh, resupplies. We did medevacs. Uh, we did troop inserts. Um, and then we also did what's called recon inserts and extracts, inserting teams of about five to six uh, Marines, recon people that we call uh, familiar snake eaters, mm -hmm. and, uh, and then extract them also. And, uh, and then we did like a little overflights sometime for recon. Okay. Reconnaissance. How many, or how big was the crew on this? The crew on this, a uh, normal crew was four. We'd have a gunner, a crew chief, pilot, and co-pilot. Okay. And then sometimes, uh, if we were designated purely for medevacs, we would have a corpsman on us, but a lot of our medevacs was uh, on the spot type stuff. Okay, uh, so the corpsman on the spot would get folks patched up and then put right. them on the helo. You'd head to base and then mm -hmm. the corpsman there mm -hmm. would come out and, Correct. and, and get you. Um, just thinking about, you know, a, a typical mission, you know, if there is such a thing, I mean, a call comes in, how long, how long would it take you to get from the base to wherever you needed to go on a, a sort of a standard day-by-day -day kind of mission? If it was an emergency. Now, regular, like regular resupply, uh, this type of troops and stuff and things, we had our briefing and everything and uh, it'd be a while. But if it's like, uh, or even on recon inserts and extracts, but if it was an emergency, uh, let's say a recon team had made contact, which they weren't supposed to be, and they were in the danger of being overran, mm -hmm. Uh, from the time we, if we were at the base, a lot of times we were already out flying. But if we were like at Marble Mountain, we could be on location uh, probably less than 15 minutes, mm -hmm. unless it was really close to the Laotian border. Yeah. Um, but we could be there pretty quick. That's from you or in your hooch or whatever you yeah, call the it. The ready room. The ready room, right. the call comes, you get right. in the helo and you're on yeah. the ground there in 15 yeah. minutes. And then, the, uh, if it was like medevacs and stuff, like a lot of times we would be doing other jobs and everybody what's called would uh, monitor what's called the Nang Dash. And if they had, uh, one of the ground pounders would have an emergency medevac and stuff, they would call up and you could hear it and go and you'd say, uh, I'm close, I can go okay, type right. stuff. And then yeah. you're only talking from the time they initiated their call to you were down picking them up, sometimes, you know, like five minutes. Sometimes it was longer than that. Right, yeah. But uh, so everybody monitored uh, uh, guard and yeah. Denang Dash, and, uh, and if you heard the call come up, whoever was there, they would take it and, mm. and go with it. Yeah. Now, was your job, you know, when you're on the ground there in I Corps, you're based at uh, south Mar of Denang, Marble mm -hmm. Mountain there, um, seven day a week job? Flying wise, we've, I would say we probably flew five days a week. Okay. But you had what's called a uh, collateral job. Uh, my job, everybody had a job on the, on the ground and stuff, and my job was what's called line officer. And as a line officer, I had all the up aircraft and all the crews, the gunners and crew chiefs under me. And so, okay. but I had a very good gunny sergeant, and I would say, you got it, you know. <laughs> and it to him, yeah. Yeah, and, that, and my yeah. deal was, I said, you know, I'll, if you keep them off my back, I'll keep them off your back. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it was very good. I uh, got to work with the the uh, uh, crew chiefs and the and the gunners very very close that mm -hmm. way, mm -hmm. and uh, good good group of people. Did you? Um, I mean, did you have the same team pretty consistently? No, we uh, the crew chiefs had an air, their own aircraft. The crew chiefs did. Okay. We never flew with the same aircraft. Oh, okay. so yeah. you know, <laughs> you go in in the morning. If uh, uh, you know, you look at the board. Okay, you've got such and such aircraft, such and such as a co-pilot, and then on the aircraft, you knew who the crew chief was going to be because of that. You wouldn't necessarily always have the same gunner either. Oh, wow. So the the bird was, uh, even though we signed for the bird, it was the, it was the crew chief's bird. Yeah, and, that's what I was going to ask. It sounds yeah, like kind of the, yeah, and uh, yeah, the and the crew chief. chiefs would. Have a little talk with you if you abuse their bird. <laughs> oh, 
Really? And they would be E5, maybe something? Uh, some of them were just, uh, some of them was like uh, Lance Corporal, which would be, I think, an E3. Okay. I'm not too sure about that one. Yeah. Um, uh, these guys, we had, uh, they were smart. We had mm -hmm. one guy, Harrigan, was, uh, he had had three years at the University of Harvard and just wow. went and joined the Marine Corps. Yeah. We had several like that. Uh, that uh, and they had to be pretty smart. They had to be smarter than we were because they had to know all the systems of the bird and how to work yeah. on it and everything. Yeah. And it's pretty complicated. The, the 46 or any, any right. helicopter is a pretty complicated uh, piece of machinery. Yeah. Um, I can see that. Let's, let's look at this, this next photo here. So what's... Basically, what's the story behind this? Behind this photo? Uh, I do not recall what the exact mission was, yeah. but it's a, it's a, a cruiser, a uh -huh. super cruiser that they had over there for yeah. uh, uh, naval su uh, support, uh, artillery support for the grunts. And I don't know what if we were taking some personnel out there or what we were, but they only had room for one bird at a time to land, and so okay. it's like all tourists, I was snapping pictures. Yeah. yeah, and so when that when that helo takes off, then yeah. likely you're gonna you're gonna right. go in and, yeah. and do whatever the job is. Yeah. We see the guns there on the on the ship. Is is that's the sort of thing that would be used for naval right. artillery support yeah. when yeah. the Marines call in. Exactly. For the um, New Jersey battleship was there at that time, mm -hmm. and that thing could lob. Uh, Volkswagen-sized shells, 25, 26 miles. Mm -hmm. And so that was their, uh, they would do that a lot. They would call, call that in because wow. it would yeah. uh, do wonders. Sure, so an example of Navy yeah. and Marines. Working. And I don't know what size uh, uh, guns those are on there. But, right. yeah. but they, uh, they, uh, the Navy gave a lot of uh, artillery yeah. support. Yeah. Of course, the Marines is, is connected to the Navy, and these branches work closely together. Did you work much with the Air Force or the Army as well, or were you uh, kind of separate most of the time? Yeah, we uh, uh, got, we got support from all of them. Everybody else has kind of supported everybody. Yeah. Uh, there was times when I would have, uh, when I was doing a recon extract, emergency extract, or even uh, medevacs, uh, not only would we have the, the uh, gunships, the Hueys, Huey gunships um, there, but we'd also have fixed wing uh, on station too. Those would be, those would be Army, the, the Hueys the, are Army? No, the Hueys, the Marines had for their gunships, oh, okay, for, the, for their guns, they had uh, okay. Huey guns. And uh, I had worked with the Navy and the uh, Marines and the uh, Air Force uh, on their uh, jets bombers or what you want to call attack, okay. attack aircraft and stuff. Yeah. All three branches, outstanding. Army helicopter pilots were great stick and rudder men. They were very, very good. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. They were, everybody was so good. So sometimes working. in operations you find yourself working yeah, with you guys, we Sometimes yeah, uh, we exactly. would help them, that's the wrong word to use, but work with them on something that they were doing and then there's times that they would work with us right. as we were doing yeah. something, it's kind of supplementing. Right. Type stuff. So it was yeah. all in ring. Yeah. Support wise, as far as uh, air air support and stuff and artillery, uh, it was a mixed bag again. You had artillery post all over the place, and right. you had to call the where you was going through that area to get clearance to go through. And uh, sometimes it was army, sometimes it was marines. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, you got your your clearance through there, hoping right. that everybody would quit shooting as you through. Right, yeah. And the same thing with the uh, with the Navy too. You had to know where they were and where they were lobbing their shells too. Mm -hmm. So, right. yeah. uh, you know, so you're yeah. up there in the middle of the air and got to talk with each other. Yeah. yeah. So you mentioned that um, you're flying about five days a week. Was there any of those days where you you didn't have any flying missions, or did you have some kind of flying mission? Well, I could say you could almost fly almost you every flying. day, but there was sometimes yeah. weather wise. Oh, okay. You could could not fly like mainly through the monsoon, monsoon season, season yeah. where it's just uh, completely everything socked in. Yeah. Um, but we would try. Yeah. I mean, there'd be a lot of times we would we would launch and we would try to fly. Yeah. If it was again now, if it was a um, just a normal resupply and stuff and things, you know, with the weather winds. Uh, but if you had a team out there that was in trouble. 
or if you had uh, emergency medevacs and stuff, if there was any way possible, you would try for it. Yeah, and sometimes, yeah. you, you know, you could win, sometimes you didn't. Yeah, meaning the weather would be yeah. too intense and you just right. couldn't get through. Yeah, well, you just couldn't see. I mean, it's... Oh, right, you just yeah. can't, yeah, yeah. Just, just can't see what you're doing. You were in Vietnam during the Tet Offensive, um, which, of course, is remembered as kind of the you know, the big event, mm -hmm. right, of, of the Vietnam War, and you were there during that time. Do you remember the Tet Offensive as being an especially intense time? To, is that the way it felt yeah. to you? Yes. Yeah, yes. how so? Uh, we kind of had a feeling that something was coming up, just from mm -hmm. some reports from the recon teams, uh, just general stuff. So, you know, so it was kind of like, uh, you know, don't let your guard down type stuff. Mm, yeah. And it was like early in the morning, one or two o'clock in the morning, they started hitting the marble. They hit everywhere simultaneously. And they were hitting us very, very hard. Uh, mm. uh, we were out there with red lens flashlights trying to pre-flight our aircraft because we were getting calls immediately for medevacs and resupplies mm. everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I flew something like 17, 18 hours that day. Wow. Uh, this is and January that was 3168. When, Sir? When the first day of Tet. Yes, yeah, and uh, yeah. and everybody was doing that. Uh, doing just don't me. It was just that was the norm. Wow. And um, so yeah, we knew something a little bit different, and the intensity of. And then we started getting hearing the reports yeah. of where it was coming in from from all over. And then uh, of course, Kason had been going on for a while. The uh, siege of Kason had already been going yeah. on for a while, and that intensified. Way Citadel. Uh, mm -hmm. That's when they came into Way and overran Way, and so we were uh, we were in the Da Nang area, uh, but uh, everybody was overloaded. And if we could spare an aircraft, we would go and try to try mm -hmm. to admit uh, one of these other places. When, during Tet, I mean, were you going throughout I Corps, or was mm -hmm. there a particular area? No, we were. Mainly our area of deal was the Da Nang up to uh, Phu Bai, all the way down to Chu Lai. Uh, we had the Korean Marines that we worked with too, oh, plus our Marines, all the way to the uh, border. And, but like I was saying is if they, were, if they were short and they had emergency going on, they would send us up. And so we, wow. we flew all the way up to the DMZ, uh, over to the border, Quezon. We did the, the, uh, the hills around Quezon. Wow. Um, the, the, the squadrons are up there doing a fantastic job. We were just coming in to try to yeah. you know, augment yeah. them. Same thing about Way. Uh, yeah. That was a, a mess too. But you know, sure. but again, that the local squadron was taking most of that. And if they but it was you short. did fly, you did do some missions, mm -hmm. a, a couple missions into Way, mm -hmm. a couple into Quezon. Well, the hills around Hike Quezon. The hills yeah, around. 861 eight, north and south and 950 yeah. and 10 yeah. something or other. But anyway, the hills around Quezon. Yeah. This may seem like a strange question, but you know, you mentioned these things, Tet, Battle for Way, Battle for Quezon. You know, hour-long documentaries are made about these battles. Um, it must be peculiar for you, you know, if you watch these documentaries, you know, n you're not like me. You know, you're the, the guy who's interested in the history. Mm -hmm. You're actually there. Um, I'm not quite sure how to how to pitch the question, but does that ever strike you as kind of strange, or or how does that strike you when you realize that I participated in the biggest mm -hmm. event of this really huge war? Mm -hmm. Has that ever struck you as you're watching I, documentaries? Like, I, I, wow, was I actually there? Yeah, yeah sometimes it that, does. Was, but yeah. my feeling is it doesn't matter what time you were there. If you were there before uh, I was there and you were there after I was there, any time you're getting shot at is a bad time. Mm. So I don't go into this thing, I had it worse than you had it type thing. Right, yeah. So yes, when I see pictures, uh, you know, I'm going, mm, well, that looks familiar. Yeah, I know there's expression on those faces. Mm. Uh, the, um, you know, there's some photos, uh, especially Way and, and stuff, the expresses on, you know, the, the looks on the, on the Marines' faces and stuff. And the same sure. thing as um, going to these other things and stuff, you're going, God, thank you, Lord, I'm home. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it's just yeah. like, how did that happen? Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's hard. It's, it's, uh, well, I mean, I've, I've heard uh, an officer who served in Iraq, and he just said, you know, uh, most people read about history, but when you're in the military, you, you're participating right. in it. And I mean, in your case, that's yeah. certainly true. Um, I imagine most days, obviously during Tet, but most days through, throughout your 13 months in, in uh, Vietnam, you know, you're doing multiple missions mm -hmm. every day. Is there, is there one particular mission that, you know, really sticks out? I imagine after a while they all kind of meld yeah, together they, into a big blob. They, they, do, they do. Yeah. And it, in orders of importance or, or importance to me or whatever, is the, uh, there were several, and, but they were like different incidents. Mm. Uh, uh, when I think I was talking about uh, the thing you had at JBU, my very first bad mission, uh, of course, that one sticks, you know, sticks in there. Uh, one of my last ones, well, kind of towards the end of my tour, uh, I was supporting a, uh, a, a company, I guess. We were staying at their outpost and stuff, and then if we get called, we go out and either supplies or a medevac and stuff. And we got called for a Vietnamese medevac. The Vietnamese had a hospital there in Da Nang, and then we would take the Vietnamese uh, farmers or whoever and stuff in. And um, a little girl, uh, seven, eight years old, uh, had stepped on a uh, road mine that mm. the VC had put in the road mm. and had blown off her, uh, her leg and she just had some of her femur sticking out. Mm. So normally you know, we went over and we landed by the road and they put her and her family on the back of the bird and I always kind of look back to see what I've got back there. And uh, this girl was holding her leg. And she, her eyes were just huge, and, and she was yelling and screaming. But it was this. What always struck me was why. You know, I don't know if that's what she was thinking or not. But it was just kind of like oh, why. You mean the, the, in her mind, that yes. Was like why? Did yeah. This, you know, know, I mean that's what I was reading. You know, and just I'm going. She goes why? So that's one that kind of sticks with me. We took her and got her and her family to the uh, Vietnamese hospital. Uh, I do not know the outcome of that mm -hmm. at all or anything. Mm -hmm. um, but that just kind of, you know, I mean, here it is. It's all the way down to not just soldiers fighting one another, but you got little kids. Little kids. And uh, yeah. the bad guys didn't care. Stuck in it. And, and now you mentioned that this was near the end of your tour. Mm -hmm. But you have all sorts of, I mean, tough experiences. And, you know, it amazes me, you know, that... You know, you know, you're operating these complicated machines in the first place. Then you're operating these complicated machines under such stressful conditions. And you have to get up and do it day after day after day after day. And, you know, you have these kinds of experiences. I'm sure you had some missions after this one that you just described. Um, but, you, I, you know, this happens and you get rattled maybe somehow, but you just have to get up the next day and, and go back at it, right? Yeah. So, I mean, what's the strategy? I mean, some guys did crack up. Mm -hmm. Some guys did crack yeah. up. What prevented you from, I mean, what, what, what made it possible for yeah. you yeah. To, to keep going? Uh, you didn't want to disappoint. We had a fantastic CO. You did not want to disappoint him. Mm. You did not want to disappoint the crew chiefs. The yeah. crew chiefs, they, they, uh, mm. uh, it, you wanted to be look good in the eyes of the crew chief. You know, I, <laughs> I mean, like that because this is the officer who <laughs> yeah. wants to look good in the eyes yeah, of the. the but, no, guy. we wanted to be in their eyes. Uh, if we lost the respect of a crew chief, then it was just like a mm. dagger in the back. Really? Wow. And. Um, mm. What made us do it, I, you know, it was a, a job is the wrong word to use, but that's kind of like, a, it's yeah. a job to use. There was times if I knew what uh, I was fragged for, frag is a, a order for the day, um, type thing, and if it was like on recon and I knew it was a bad situation stuff, I mean, I physically would get sick. Mm. Uh, I would, you know, before we, you know, climbing the bird and stuff, yeah. um, I'd be off the side throwing oh, up a little bit. Really? And but you know you strap in, it's training, 
Yeah. Everything starts taking place. Your mind's occupied with what you happen to do. Yeah. Um, and there's, you know, and there's some humorous uh, uh, times too in the in the bad situation and stuff. Yeah. And uh, you know, and I kind of would have to say, you know, better better that I'm where I'm at than being where these guys are, because the ground pounders. Uh, that's what it was all about, supporting them. Mm -hmm. um, you get a uh, 17 now, 18, 19 year old kid on the radio. Uh, he's trying to call in the medevacs. Uh, he, he's, he's scared, rightly so. Yeah. Some of them are very, very calm. Some of them were, were scared. You'd have to talk to them uh, to try to get your good directions and stuff from them and, and try to talk to them, the recon teams. Yeah. I mean, th these recon teams, uh, the, the example of, of, of what these guys went through, I mean, we put them back in the boondocks. They were not supposed to be compromised by anybody and stuff. And so They're out there looking them. for the enemy to report right. back, right? They'd report yeah. back, or they could even call artillery in if they could see them on a far trail and stuff. And, uh, and these guys, uh, we always knew we'd make a uh, contact with them, and, and the only team I can remember call sign was Green Reefer, and and uh, we going to extract them. It was time for them to be extracted out, mm -hmm. and we go uh, Green Reefer, Green Reefer, Bonnie Sue, and Bonnie Sue was our call sign, and it'd be quiet. Mm -hmm. You go that Green Reefer, Green Reefer, Bonnie Sue, and you go Bonnie Sue, Bonnie Sue, Green Reefer, wow. and you go Oh no, <laughs> which means they were that close to the bad guys that they could not talk loud. And, and yeah. you know, uh, I talked to some of those guys. They said they'd go uh, get under bushes at night and stuff, wake up the next morning, and the NVA would be camped around them. Uh, mm. You know, like I'm saying, they had to stay there all day long and stuff. But uh, these guys were, they were professionals. They were very good. They were young kids. Yeah. It sounds like what you're, what you're saying is, I mean, you know, you, you get the mission, you know it's going to be bad. You, you know, throw up in the field and <laughs> then get to your, get to your bird. But... You know, part of the way you deal with it is by taking your mind off yourself and putting your mind on, like you said, that 19-year-old radio operator who's calling you saying we need a medevac, the um, the reconnaissance guys, the mm -hmm. you know what the CO needs, what the what the crew chief needs. It sounds like that's that's kind mm -hmm. of what you're saying. One of the things that keeps you going. Mm -hmm. It's very common. I hear this from from vets a lot and. In your case, you know, it wasn't anything philosophical about, you know, um, def you know, defending democracy is a great thing to do, mm -hmm. but, you know, yeah, day right. to day in war, I, I just don't gather yeah. many people are thinking about that, you know, it's, it's very practical, mm -hmm. isn't it? Right. Me surviving and the guy next to me mm -hmm. surviving and my obligation to him. And that's yeah. it. That's it. Uh, no, you didn't sit there and make a debate about pros, cons or anything else. Our job was support the guy on the ground. Yeah. That's the way I approached it is whatever I could do to help that man yeah. and, or, or men, men or whatever. Uh, yeah. And so I didn't get into, I mean, you could drive yourself nuts trying to do the right, wrong, whatever and stuff. Right. It's not the time yeah. for the debate. Yeah. Th there will be a time for philosophy later. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right, now we, <laughs> right now there's a job to do. That's right. Yes, sir. Well, thank you very much, Mike. Okay. appreciate it. Thank you. Great. Mike, uh, what are we looking at in this photo here? That's one of the, uh, you call it, I guess, an outpost of stuff, a little bit of a high ground. But that's uh, kind of a little bit elevated there. Uh, probably a company size uh, battalion, or not battalion, but a company size Marines. That's probably their main base that they operated out of. Okay. And uh, that's their little landing zone. You can see the 46 sitting down there. Uh, we'd go in and resupply them there at that base. And or if they had medevacs, we could take medevacs out at that place. So the the forty six is in that blue square. Yeah. Uh huh. Oh, so that's the landing zone. Yeah. Is that exactly. how you knew that's where the landing zone is? Yeah. In? It's, it's yeah. It's color. usually Martian mat matting. Oh, um, I see. If you're familiar with that, <clears throat> is what they make those things out of. And okay. Those were the non uh, lethal type missions going in there and stuff. And now I see in the bottom of the photo. Uh, looks like a number of um, craters of, of some sort. Yeah, Any idea what that's about? I would imagine those are for mortars. Uh, they would get mortared and rocketed uh, quite often, and I would imagine that's probably where they fell short. Uh, 
And they could have been coming from the base too with their counter uh, counter attack. Oh, okay. So maybe VC are right. moving on the base and so they're getting yep. hit with mortars or maybe those are, I guess that would be more likely, right? Because if the VC were actually mortaring the base, yep. they'd, they would be, they'd be inside there. Did you take the photo, do you recall, because of the, the I, I, uh, hold, the craters there, or just for the base? I just took it because there was a 46 sitting in there, and, and I oh. thought it was my wingman that day. And, yeah. uh, you know, he's just wow. he's a typical American tourist. He just mm -hmm. snapped pictures. Mm -hmm. And he gets so used to seeing craters like that, maybe after mm -hmm. a while you don't yep. even notice them anymore. What are we looking at here? Uh, Fixed wing jets uh, doing ground support, dropping uh, bombs, and that may have been maybe even some napalm. I'm not too sure. Wow. Uh, in support of uh, probably uh, some fellas that's gotten some trouble and they needed a tree line uh, taken care of. Uh, yeah. Close close air support is what it's called. Yeah. So you've got army or marines out there. Yeah, uh, those are probably marine probably uh, marines out, out there. there. Um, in a firefight and they, yep. they call in for help. Right. Yeah. And w when the help is called for, is it just general, general, we need some sort of support and then someone else decides whether it's air or Navy or how does that, uh, how does that work? Or will the officer on the, on the ground yeah. make that call? They, again, I talked about Denang Dash, and that's who they would call the Marines, and I guess the Air Force probably did too. They had pilots sitting in the, in the um, in the ready room or something? No, uh, they would actually be sitting in their birds. Uh, I'm trying to think, hot seat, hot point, something or other. Yeah. Anyway, they would actually be sitting in their birds. They would be strapped in. They would have a uh, power unit hooked up to them. Wow. And so if the, the call came in, uh, and, and then you could get, there was times when I was trying to get a team out. I had uh, Air Force and Marines stacked up, jets stacked up. Uh, the fact the Ford Air Controller uh, was in a in one of the Hueys, uh, directing them, telling them wh where they needed to go, yeah. and put their stuff. But they, we had a mix mixed bag, okay. and had them uh, stacked up. Right. What do you mean by stacked up? Uh, well, you'd get there, and so you'd already have a couple of planes working an area, and uh -huh. so you just stack the next one up here and another one on top of them, and then you'd bring them down each time. You, these people got their ordinance all done with. Then you'd bring down oh, the next, the next two, I see what you're saying. and uh, okay. to uh, yeah. yeah, so you could stack them up there. And so, for example, you may have a you may have a helo that comes in and, and does something, and then but then the plane's on scene, and then the the fixed wing will come mm -hmm. in then and hit something. Is yeah. that kind of what you mean, something like that? Yeah. Okay. Let's um, let's look at the what is this here? That's an old, the, the plane is a C-47, uh, the old Goonie Bird from World War II. Um, it had Gatling guns pointed out the side of it. Uh, yeah. And every sixth round was a tracer. So if you look at that, that's a solid stream right there. And between yeah. each one of those, there's five other rounds wow. in between each one of those things there. Uh, used for close air support. Uh, if an outfit was starting to get overran, they could call in, and it's called Puff, the Magic Grab Dragon, and uh, call him in, and he could uh, do a lot of uh, damage. Wow. Uh, saved a lot of lives, a lot of people uh, yeah. from the, uh, being overran. Now this is, is I mean, uh, under what conditions would this particular uh, aircraft be, be called out for, do you know? That particular reason, I do not know, but normally yeah. it was be, uh, let's say you had, a, well, even like that compound we looked at a while ago. Mm -hmm. um, if they were being overran by mass quantities of the bad guys and stuff, they could come in and hose down the countryside mm -hmm. and uh, repel the attack. Uh, if you had a, a team out, let's say you had a squad out, eight or nine people out somewhere, and they were in the world of hurt, uh, you could call these people in and stuff. Wow. And then there was a plane, Goonie Bird type, same type of looking airplane, but it dropped flares, and it could light up like daylight, drop flares, and it looked like daylight. But when we were going in mm -hmm. to pick up um, a recon team again or medevacs, instead of having them drop flares where we were, we would have them drop the flares over by a ridge line, and we could see from the shadows, we could see where we wanted to go and need to go, wow. because we didn't want to get lit up 
like a Christmas tree with a flare going off, and there we are, oh, you know, yeah. for God and everybody to see. Sure, yeah. And so uh, the, those two birds were their Air Force and uh, did a great job, and, and uh, we utilized them yeah. a lot. Tell us about this story here. What's the story behind this photo? Um, I was a co-pilot. <coughs> the guy on the left is uh, George Lee. He was the uh, aircraft commander. And it's kind of hard to see, but we're... Oh, the guy on your left, but on our right. Is yeah, right? the guy without the hat. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. I'm the guy without the hat. He's the guy with the hat. Right, yeah. Yeah. And um, anyway, if you can look closely, you can see where my gun's kind of pointed right there. There's a hole right there where we'd gotten hit just flying along fat, dumb, and happy Ooh. at altitude. And uh, someone got a lucky shot at us and hit us there. Mm -hmm. And we didn't, we heard it when it hit us, but we didn't know what it was or anything until we got back to base and we started looking the aircraft over and and there it was right underneath my seat uh, where that uh, entry, the entry hole right wow. there. Um, just some guy sniped you from the ground and... Yeah. You know, I mean, uh, yeah, they, you know, they were shooting at us all the time. You know, you didn't know when they were and when they weren't. Yeah. Unless it was like, you could see the, the AK-47s had green tracers and uh, if it was a 51 caliber, uh, and an aircraft deal, it almost looked like aluminum beer cans flying past you. Wow. Uh, but uh, that there, I'm, I'm assuming it was an AK because we were probably flying around 2,000, 2,500 AGL, and uh, and it was a lucky shot. Yeah. Uh, just you know, they, I mean, they, you know, they, you know, it's kind of like, well, let's shoot. We can, get, we might get lucky. Yeah. Did you it know? penetrate and go through? Yeah, the it's an uh, entry hole there. I do not remember where the exit hole was, but that's the entry hole right there. Boy, there was an, an exit hole as well. Yeah. So did it go up right between the two of you? Uh, I think it actually, and what I remember when it happened, uh, the, the, the helicopter has what's called a collective, and you can kind of see it in the window there, the thing that's at an angle. Uh -huh. It's called a collective, and I can't remember if I was flying or if George was flying, and but you had your hand on the collective, and I can remember that it actually came up between my hand and the armored seat. Uh, between uh, your hand and the, and the arm and the seat. seat. Yeah. So that's and probably a pretty small space. There. Yeah. So. Wow. Yeah. So, yeah, so it's, that's what the smiles are all about. We were okay. Uh, yeah. That is, uh, that, so that obviously comes under the category of close call. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, um, I don't know. Have you kept a list of the close calls? I imagine there are there are a number of those for you. Uh, that, that not one a, obviously is, but not a list. And yeah. as we were talking earlier, everything kind of gets merged yeah. into one things. Yeah. There was times uh, you would you know you're going like sitting at night. You'd be in, like in a zone taking medevac out, and you're sitting there and you're waiting for them to load the medevacs out in the back. And you sit there and these green tracers are flying back and forth in the zone, you know, and you're sitting there and you're going, oh my gosh, you know, they're, they're coming at me, they're straight at me and stuff, you think. And we would go back and then look wow. for battle damage. We couldn't see any battle damage. Really? And, uh, you know, it's kind of like, how did that happen? And there was other times where a single round like that would hit you. Yeah. Um, yeah. It was, um, you know, it's, it's kind of like a collage of things. And like I say, it's like taking out, uh, uh, a recon team that was uh, yeah. being overran, literally being overran, and uh, uh, you know there's supposed to be like eight of them, and so you go and you drop your ramp, and you got you know you got the Huey guns flying around, and you got our fifties going, and and the recon teams they run in and they put their our windows were gone, and they'd pay what called stagecoach, they'd be shooting out the, the windows and stuff, and the crew chief says, okay, we can go, we can go, and you'd go, okay, give me a count. He says, we got seven. And you're going, oh, no. No, 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 no. <laughs> and, then, and then he goes, okay, 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 we're okay, we're okay, miscounted. There's eight. And you go, button up, and yeah. away we would go. Wow. And, you know, and, and, and uh, so, you know, there's just, yeah. you, you sit there a lot of times, and you just, you know, just sweating it out, you know, so everybody gets on. Well, that's what, I mean, this is the, the question I have, because... You know, the guys who are loading the helos, they're busy, they're occupied, you know, and they've got something to do. But I guess for those minutes, couple minutes, however long it is, mm -hmm. you're just sitting there, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, I mean, what's, 
how do you hold it together? I mean, that's that's it's an unanswerable question. I realize, <laughs> you know, but it just mystifies me. I mean, you know, if you're busy doing something, then I can I can kind of understand. But at that moment, you know, you're going to be operating this machine pretty soon, mm -hmm. and that keeps you occupied. But at this moment, you're just sitting there. Well, and you're. Your mind's always going, you know. I mean, you're looking to see where the fire is coming from, and and uh, the crew chief and the gunners are pretty good. They can see where fire is coming from, but if you can yeah. see it, you can call out where it is from the bird and stuff. Yeah. You're watching. You see the bad guys coming. There's been times where, uh, uh, well, you're sitting there. I mean, the the uh, coal pilots even shooting out the window. Well, I was going to ask you. Yeah. I mean, did, yeah. were you able to yeah. yourself engage yeah. the enemy during mm -hmm. those minutes? Okay. And uh, well, if the pilot, he would stay on the controls, even while you're sitting in the zone. And, okay. uh, but, um, you know, you see him coming, you do what you did. And, so you uh, could open your window and... Yeah, yeah, we had a little sliding window there. And, yeah. And uh, you do a rat-a-tat-tat. -tat. Yeah. But, uh, but it was, you know, like I said, we called stagecoach. Uh, you'd have all the recon team shooting out the windows and stuff and things, and the gunners are going. And, uh, wow, that's so, so just to go back to this photo, so I see that you're holding a weapon there. I don't recognize what that is. That is a Thompson submachine gun oh, with a stock off of it. does not have the stock. Okay. And that's two clips uh, taped together. And that shot, oh, okay. 45 rounds, 45 caliber rounds is what that shot. Yeah. Good, good, good weapon. And is that what you had with you a lot of the time? Yeah, that was it. Okay. Everybody kind of had their own. When I first got there, um, I think I had an M14, and it's big and it's bulky. Uh, some of the guys had shotguns, mm -hmm. <coughs> uh, sawed off shotguns and stuff. The, uh, I traded that out to a ground pounder, uh, uh, got the Thompson, and it would sit between, stand between my seat and the door. Uh, it fit perfectly right there. Okay. And, uh, yeah. Wow, that's something. Let's go to uh, what is the story behind this photo? Uh, yeah. We got that's at Marble Mountain, and we got rocketed and mortared, and that's uh, uh, fragments uh, from the shells that hit close to that. Oh, I see. The yeah. explosion and stuff. So the thing was having the windows taken out there. And then the the story of uh, of the Purple Heart here. So you and uh, what's the fellow's name there? Who's Fred Pratt. So Fred. Yeah. So you and Fred have, have just been um, awarded Purple Hearts. What is the what's the story behind behind this? Uh, Fred and I. I was uh, aircraft commander. Fred was the co-pilot. Uh, the same day that uh, we met, in fact, that um, little Vietnamese girl. Oh, yeah. Same day we met back to her, yeah. and uh, we got her to the hospital, and then we were coming back to the uh, where the uh, battalion was that we were supporting, and we got called in for uh, emergency medevac. Okay. And uh, it was down, it was south of Marble. Uh, most of the railroad lines are kind of like elevated and stuff, and the, the, where we were picking up the medevacs were down low between that. And it was a couple of them, and um, uh, we made it in okay. I called, again, you make your initial contact, you try to find out where the good guys, bad guys are, so you can tell your gunners where, the, where they can fire, where they can't fire, and they said they had patrols out everywhere, and there was bad guys everywhere, but the good guys were everywhere, so we couldn't, couldn't return fire. And I told my, my gunners, I said, you can return fire if you absolutely see exactly where it's coming from. You can re uh, do that. And, um, um, so anyway, we picked them up, we took fire going in, we're okay, we're coming out, and we were taking fire from all different directions and stuff, and I kept trying to turn away from the fire where it was coming from, and I had it in a really tight turn coming out, and the centerpiece of the, of the windshield uh, exploded. And uh, we took rounds right through that thing. And in fact, it was such a fast thing, I thought we took in an airburst is what I thought we'd have taken. Yeah. And uh, my first call was I called in the back and I said, you know, everybody okay back there? And they said, yes, we're okay. And I said, well, check us, make sure there's nothing wrong there. And I looked over at Fred and he had some uh, uh, shrapnel wounds, no, nothing bad, neither one of us was bad and stuff. And 
kind of give a little history here. When you took people to the aid station or to the hospital, they strip them. And the reason why is you only hurt what you see. Right. So you could have an arm wound and think that's where it is, and they strip them down, they'd have like a big mm -hmm. trunk uh, wound yeah. and stuff. So that's in my head, and, and so I had some shrapnel, you know, blood and stuff and things, mm -hmm. but nothing bad. And um, so I said, Fred, you okay? And he goes, yeah, I'm okay. And I said, well, I'm looking at this thing, and you know, I'm going, man, that looks like that's right at me. Where these holes came out, and and because uh, it was kind of like this, and I uh, said, uh, he said, yeah, and I said, well, go ahead and take it. And so I'm over there, and I'm I'm trying to see that, and I turn around, and I couldn't see the impact point behind me, mm. and I'm going, uh, man. So I'm going, maybe I'm dead, and I'm in, a, I'm, in, I'm in the next dimension and don't know it, you know, what it is. So I'm sitting there, and we had these bullet bounces. Did you really have on. thought? I did. I thought yeah. I was dead, and I was trying to feel I like, couldn't see anything, and wow. I had my visor up, and I couldn't see anything, and I was feeling the top of my head. And Fred wow. goes, he says, Bear, what are you doing? <laughs> and I said, Fred, I think I'm hit, but I don't know it. Wow. <laughs> you know? He says, wow. why? And I said, I can't find the, the impact. And he said, well, they're right behind you. And when we got back to the wow. base, to, we, we took the medevacs in, and then we went back because we was going to get another bird. That bird was going to be down. Our uh, CO and the operation officer met us in the Jeep and took us down to sick bay. And the flight surgeons uh, scraped out the little bit of strap and all the stuff and sewed and patch you up and patch you on the butt and get back in there, you know, type thing. How much of a vacation did you get after that? Uh, I, flew that I flew that day. I flew <laughs> the next day. <laughs> yeah, the next day. <laughs> like I said, literally, pat you on the butt and get back in there. <sighs> wow, that's something. So, so that's the story of the, of the Purple Heart. Yeah. And this is the same day in a different conversation you were telling us, a uh, different discussion, you mentioned this powerful memory you had of this poor girl who stepped on a mine that yeah. I think the NVA had laid. and. Mm -hmm. So these two events happened on one day. Yeah, they did. That's a pretty big day, and it's near the end of your near the end of your thirteen months. There's the other story I remember you tell about. We were just talking about the, you know these minutes when you're on the ground, and uh, there's the one story you tell of. I think when an NVA soldier had you right in his right in mm -hmm. his sights. The uh, yeah. we were doing a um, troop insert. And it was in tall elephant grass. I was flying as a co-pilot <coughs> on the left-hand side. And uh, we had landed in the elephant grass. And probably 25, 30 feet away, his NVA stands up. And he has his AK-47. And he's, you know, right at me. Wow. And it looked like it was at me. And so I was trying to get, get on the ICS to the gunner to tell him. I said, you know, uh, you know 10 o'clock, 10 o'clock. You know, and before I even said 10 o'clock, the guy's head exploded. Uh, the gunner saw him. Uh, our 50s uh, yeah. hit him. Our, our 50s were uh, an amazing uh, fire suppressor. Sure, yeah, they did good imagine. work. But anyway, yeah, he's I just. I mean, that's just one of those bam. instances where a half a second makes, yep, makes exactly. a difference. So I was going to ask was this one of your life passes before your eyes moments? But it sounds like he, you know you kind of reacted real quick and... Yeah, it, it's... Um, things happen so fast, I don't think you have time to have your life going. Now, if you were having um, uh, time lapse in there, um, you would have time for stuff like that to kind yeah. of kind of happen to you and stuff. Yeah. But yeah. this stuff's so, so fast that all you're doing is it, your training oh, kicks that's in. So that's, you, know, you just can't say enough about training. You, you yeah. know, train, 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 train. Yeah. And so you're doing everything training-wise. Your mind's going 90 miles an hour. You're yeah. making decisions uh, in microseconds. Um, so what about, like, you know, you, you <coughs> see the NVA guy. He's got his AK on you. The 50 cal gets him. I mean, is there just a little pause, like, wow? Or is just, like, right on to the next thing? Well... In that instance, I mean, there was still just gunfire going everywhere. So, I mean, it wasn't time to say there was this nice, quiet, peaceful time. I mean, that happened. Yeah. He just, Gunner went on to another target. The crew chief's off to another target. You had uh, 
you know, the other birds are doing the same thing. We're, yeah. getting, we're getting our troops off, sure. trying to get our troops off and get as yeah. many troops in the zone as you can get. So Now, how about, so, you know, uh, you mentioned, um, I think in a different discussion, you know, you have flying missions about five days a week and then other work two days a week. Those two days when things are maybe a little quieter, is that when some of this stuff would kind of... Mm -hmm you know, you'd kind of reflect on them a little bit or still just like, I'm not going to deal yeah, with this stuff I right mean, now? Yeah, um, it's kind of like what ifs. Mm -hmm. You know, but what if I was just a half a knot slower or a half a knot faster? Where would that round have been? The one that if broke it, the, yeah. the... If I'd have been the glass a on the tad less than an angle. If, uh, and you know, and we had close calls just uh, landing and stuff, you know, if it had been just that much more. Uh, one of the times I was coming back from our bill down there was in the Jeep and uh, my corporal was driving and uh, on the road and then all of a sudden there was just like a puff out there and it was a, 50 cal a spent 50 caliber that had been shot at us from out somewhere. And I'm going, okay, if we'd have been one mile an hour faster, <laughs> you know? So you can go, go crazy at the, on the what ifs yeah. and the what ifs and stuff. Um, That's yeah. something. That is something else. Well, thank you very much. I know it's not. Uh, I know it's no fun for you to share these stories, yeah. but I appreciate you doing it. Thank well, you, you do a good job in asking. <laughs> oh, thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks. Mike, what do you remember about the country itself, Vietnam itself? The the country itself was actually a very pretty country and as you've you have been there sure, and, yeah. and you know what it's like you go back in some of these uh, uh, valleys and stuff that there is right during the monsoon season uh, mm -hmm. you see how the clouds hang so low and stuff and everything's wet sure. and stuff um, you, you get way back especially up around the caisson area you get back in some of those valleys back there and you could come across the old uh, temples and stuff, kind of like mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. out of the book, was it Jungle Book or what it was, and the, <laughs> the vines growing over everything yeah, and stuff, yeah. and we'd fly by and look at them and stuff. Mm. Um, the, uh, like I said, it's a beautiful country, and the people uh, kind of have to understand the people, that's all they've known their whole entire life is, is war. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So once you understand that, um, I enjoyed the people that I worked with. Uh, it's almost like uh, two different types of people, the people that uh, fought against and the people that not fighting with them. Yeah, and, uh, sure. So. And, of course, you know, you're dealing with uh, North Vietnamese Army, but right. also Viet Cong. Correct. Um, here's one of your photos from the war. And uh, do you happen to remember where this was? was That's just south of, of uh, Marble Mountain okay. themselves. It's, yeah. it's that I was uh, the last couple of months, few months. Uh, I was over there. I was what's called our uh, civic action officer, yeah. and uh, it's part of the winning the hearts and minds of the people type thing. Right. Uh, these little villages would have what's called I think they're called cat teams. They would have uh, three or four Marines that actually lived with them and stuff. Oh yeah, I've heard of this. And yeah. uh, the, this particular village. Mm -hmm. um, we were trying to, uh, in fact we did, we picked up a uh, project for them to earn money which was actually going through our middle scrap area and reselling it. I would keep the money and then donate the money, not donate, but donate the money out and they built a dispensary and a, what's called a public school for them there. Yeah. And uh, because you didn't want to give them all the money at one time because, like again, they've been at war all this time and drafts and they wouldn't have the money and stuff. So just enough right. to go every day. Yeah. Um, we did very well. This, this village was very, um, very well. They put a, uh, the uh, MVA put a bounty on my gunny sergeant and wow. me's heads. We had a bounty on our heads. Wow. Uh, when the uh, dispensary in the school was completed, they uh, came through the day as the NVA came through and told the villagers that if you utilize this stuff, we will come in and kill your whole family. And we put uh, what's called the PFs, the Popular Forces, which is kind of like our National Guards, uh, around it uh, to keep it, you know, protected and stuff. Yeah, yeah. They did, uh, did blow up my Jeep one time. I wasn't there. Uh, my 
Lance Corporal lost a forearm from it. Golly. But again, the people, um, I think, saved everybody on that. When we had our flight squadron down there and stuff, and we had what's called a med calf that once a week the flight surgeon and a corpsman would go down mm -hmm. to the village yeah. and hold a, a sick call if you want for anything different than that. Sure. And that particular day, they kept basically kept them there longer than what they normally would be kept there. They just kept bringing people in and basically dragging their feet and kept them longer oh, than I longer. Yeah. So if they'd have left when they would normally would have left and got in the Jeep, they would have gotten blown up all in the Jeep. The Jeep didn't blow up until they were actually just leaving the building. Wow. Uh, the dispensary. So the locals probably knew. They did. They know. This. They know. And, and wow. they, uh, without them saying anything and them getting into trouble, that's the only way they knew about how to save yeah. the Americans that were trying to help them. Boy, it's just, it's an illustration of folks caught in the middle, right? Yeah, folks mm -hmm. caught in the middle. Um, they want to benefit from the Hearts and Minds program that you're mm -hmm. part of, mm -hmm. the medical assistance and mm -hmm. educational assistance and all these things, but then the NVA is threatening them. And yep. Yeah, it's something. Let's, let's look at the, at the photo again. Were you confident that you could trust the folks? For example, I'm looking at that fellow there in the in the white there, I mean, could you trust that he I, is a I, you know, I'm sure that, um, I mean, there was VC in there. Yeah. I did, but when they came out with a, a bounty on, on, on my gunny and myself yeah. and stuff, I went down and spent a night down there just to show, uh, I was very scared, mm -hmm. <laughs> but just to show, you know, that you can't do that. You know, you yeah. can't bully these people. Mm -hmm. and, um, uh, and so they, uh, yeah, yeah, they were there and stuff, but I think yeah. maybe there was enough of the good people there that saying, no, sure. you're not going to mess with these guys. Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, sounds like they, it. they did, they, they, the, uh, they had what's called a chief, which is like a mayor, and they had a police chief, mm -hmm. uh, and they blew up his uh, house and killed him and one of his wife's, one of his wife, one of his kids. Yeah. And... Uh, so, I mean, they were active in the area. Wow. Uh, when we were having the dedication of the dispensary, and they had a little dinner for us type stuff, and my uh, corporal uh, found in his trigger guard on his rifle a little propaganda thing that was a North Vietnamese propaganda against Johnson and the bombing and stuff. Wow. And they slipped, he never knew when it got slipped in there wow. or anything. So, I mean, they were, they were among us. And, uh, yes. but they, I think like I said, they, they yeah. looked after us and, and, uh. I mean, a pretty us. clever enemy, right? I mean, mm -hmm. pretty clever. Yeah. yeah. That's something. Well, let's look at this, at this, uh, other photo here. Uh, cause, uh, when I looked at, at these photos of yours, you know, I just saw, a, you know, a little Viet Vietnamese boy there looking at the photo on the left, but. Apparently he was an important asset to you, so he tell, was. Us, tell us about him. He was. He was, I, I'm guessing, anywhere from 9 to 10 years old. I used him as my interpreter. <laughs> uh, wow. He could speak French and English, and of course the native Vietnamese language. Wow. And a uh, typical 9 or 10 year old kid, smiling, you know, joking around, wanted to kid with you and everything. Mm. But if I needed to talk to any of the people in the village and stuff, I would go through him and uh, wow. did a great job. Uh, I've wondered what uh, became of him. I, you know, I hope he made it. Yeah, wow. Mm -hmm. You mentioned uh, when we were talking off camera that you, know, you had thoughts of trying to get him to the States maybe? Or? Yeah, I, I thought about maybe trying to see if I could adopt him. I was single, and uh, the paperwork would have been atrocious uh, to try to get him over here. And also, I did not know what the... Uh, environment was back here in the United States as far as was there people who had lost somebody would be very bitter against a Vietnamese kid yeah, yeah. or anything like that. So uh, I took the path of least resistance and didn't do it. Yeah, but uh, yeah. but he, he, he was a smart, um, kid, smart how, kid. How long was he with you? Uh, maybe three months. Wow. Yeah. Okay. And he was just a local kid who yeah. attached himself to yeah. you guys. Yeah, and I don't even know. I don't even know if his parents were alive or not. He just really? was there. Yeah, he was there when I'd come in. He'd be there, and, wow. and uh, you know, he just show up. Yeah, 
And, uh, wow. and so, you know, and we'd, we'd give him, you know, candy or something or other, you know, and stuff. Mm. But, uh, and, but he, I think he really liked being able to be the interpreter. I really do. Cause he's <laughs> well, it's a big job. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's a big job for a, a 10 year old. What, uh, what memories uh, do the picture on the right uh, bring up? Any particular um, memories there? Just, uh, just the normal people. Um, they all had little kids. Yeah. Um, and you know they're just uh, they're just survival. They're just trying to survive. Mm -hmm. That was mainly that village, that part of that village. It, the hamlets I had several different hamlets. That particular one was the was rice paddies. They had one that was a fishing village more out on the coast and different things. But that was more of a, a farming uh, deal there. Yeah, yeah. Aside from the the boy there on the left. Did you feel that it was ever possible, really, to establish kind of a, you know, a working relationship with, with local Vietnamese, or was there always the concern that, you know, maybe the VC are, maybe these are VC? I, I, I guess I'm partly getting at the question of trust. I mean, aside yeah. from that boy, were, did you yeah. feel like there were some you could really could trust to work with? You, you could. Um, yeah. They would tell us. Uh, sometimes they would tell us uh, where the VC were wow. and stuff uh, and things. But I think they, they were pretty smart. They would do just enough to keep themselves out of trouble, right. but enough to yeah. keep us out of trouble. Yeah. And so they walked a pretty fine line and stuff. But I, you know, uh, given everything being equal, I think they, you know, I, I trusted them. Uh, not all of them, yeah, but you know, sure. or I should say, maybe I trust them with with my eyes wide open. I don't right, know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You just get the feeling a lot of these folks are just walking a tightrope, aren't they? Yeah. Just trying to hope to get through, you know, because yeah. Yeah. yeah, this this big thing mm -hmm. is going on around them. Let's look at this uh, one last photo here, and a slightly different theme here. These are. Uh, these are guys from South Korea, right? Correct. The, uh, Republic of Korea, or the the Rock, yeah, right. the Rock Forces. Right. And you, uh, so you worked with the South Korean yes. troops to some extent. The uh, Korean Marines uh, were down in that area. We, I first got there; they were south of Chulai, and then they moved their area of operation up to just south of the Da Nang area and stuff. Okay. Uh, basically, they're crazy. Yeah. <laughs> what do you mean by that? Yeah. But they were yeah. they were fun to work with, uh, yeah. but they they were completely no nonsense type of people as far as the, an NCO and a private. I mean, um, they didn't think anything of knocking them on the ground if they needed to get their attention and oh, stuff. Really? And, wow. and um, so some old school discipline. Uh, there, yeah, and it, it's little sidebar one day when they had like outposts at different places and we'd yeah. re do the resupply for them or take out their medevacs and we was in there one day and they had a kid not a kid a, one of the marines was uh, tied to a post wow. up there and people would come up to him and they'd uh, shake their head and pat him on the head and they'd shake the head mm -hmm. walk away and it was about our third time in there and i said I called up the uh, Anglico, which was the American li liaison between us and the radio deal. I said, what's the story over here on this? You know? mm. I said, well, I said, you, you may be taking his body out of here tomorrow. Well, I said, what? Yes. I said, well, he had a pet monkey. <laughs> and his pet monkey bit another Korean. That oh Korean killed the monkey, so he killed the guy. Oh, you know, and I'm just going, oh my gosh, I don't want to hear any more. <laughs> you know. So the word was they were going to execute this guy for yeah. and killing the other that's Marine. Yeah, he's going to give him a quick, uh, probably a quick uh, oh, court martial. And, and, do you know how that story played out? No, I do not. I don't know how that story and played I, out. You know, I don't know. But, yeah. but anyway, they, oh. uh, you know, they, they, um, they were funny people, though. They, they, always, they always thought that their helicopters were there. They'd run up, put their hand on the helicopter, and get their picture taken next to it. Oh, and, yeah, yeah. And stuff and things. I've, I've heard that the rock troops, uh, the, you know, the South Korean troops, didn't have a whole lot of use for things like the Geneva Conventions and no. rules of war and things like no. that. So. They, um, no, they did not. I won't go there. Okay. I won't okay. go there. Yeah, that's, that's fine. <laughs> Just to, so without, without going into details, um, 
when you were doing operations with them, was it just understood that the rocks will, they'll do things their way and we'll do mm -hmm. things our way and mm -hmm. we're just not going to and then and I, let that be? Yeah, they, uh, uh, yeah, they, they, they maintained a certain uh, kill ratio. Uh, we won't go into that either. Yeah. But, um, yeah. but they, they, you know, they, you, sometimes you had to explain things to them. Uh, there was times where the uh, their radio operator, which was American, would be talking to us, and they were saying, "Would you please come down here? You know, land down here. And go, what do you got?" And says, "Well, I've got a rifle pointed at me," and said that if I don't get you guys down here, they're going to shoot me. And all they wanted was a, a taxi service, move us from one spot to another spot. Really? And we're going, mm, "How are we going to work with this one?" Yeah. <laughs> you know? So I said, wow. "We'll land." you get on our bird and we're going to get you out of there. Really? And, uh, and we yeah. had to do that a couple of times and yeah. stuff because they, did, they had no concept. They just thought that we were their, their personal taxis and really? stuff. Okay. Yeah. So you're allies, but it sounds like maybe kind of allies at arm's length. Is that yeah. kind of well, I think that's do a, what they do in their world? And I think that's the only way they understand how things work yeah. is by threats. Okay. And as I think of what they, yeah. yeah. I mean, I've had them do the same thing. My crew chief, they'd come on, and we'd be at their main little place picking up a supply to go someplace, and they would draw a weapon on my on my crew chief. And this one time, and said, and of course he came up on the intercom. My crew chief did, and says, I, you know, I've got a problem back here in the back, and I asked him what it was, yeah. and he said, Well, this guy's threatened to shoot me if we don't take him to see his friend okay. at another place, oh, and boy. I said, Well. Hold on, I said, and I and I called the oh, uh, the um, uh, the liaison person. Yeah. I said I'm shutting down in, in the bird, and you get some people over here. I said we're not going anywhere. Yeah. So I shut the bird down, so we couldn't move, we couldn't go anywhere or anything. And uh, South anywhere. Korea is a very different place now than it was then. I mean, yeah. it's gone through quite a, a transformation. Um, this must have been one of the, you know, the many things, or you know. Tell me what, what your response is, but it seems to me that this must have been one of the many things that makes Vietnam something of a surreal experience. Um, the allies that we had. Mm -hmm. If we're talking about the Australians, that's one thing. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, the, the troops from the South Vietnamese troops weren't always reliable. I mean, you probably have stories about mm -hmm. that. Then you've got the stories about, about the rocks. Um, it, was this a... Was this something that passed through your mind from time to time? Like, you know, these allies we have are well, I think kind of weird. Going back to the, the Koreans, they understood the Oriental mind, mm -hmm. the Asian mind. So that style and, of warfare that we saw and, in World and, War II. And they, they, so they fought that way yeah. because they understood what it took. You, you had to be a certain way. You had to do certain things. You mm -hmm. had to be mean and nasty. And they, they understood this. So the Korean Marines were, I mean, I have no qualm with their fighting ability um, because uh, they understood the thinking, you know, just mm. the way it is. You kill one, you kill a lot, you know, back and yeah, forth. Yeah. The, um, the Arvins, um, that's just an interesting thing. When you go to move all the Arvins, you're moving the family, you're moving pigs, <laughs> geese. And everything else, they just all went in mass and stuff, and they had uh, <coughs> didn't really have a good leadership program because most of these people were just like us, were draftees and stuff. I mean, yeah. they were just coming in, and just draft them, take them yeah. out and stuff. Their Arvin Air Force was very good. Uh, we had some go through flight school with us down in Pensacola. Uh, uh, so the I guess because the, the only the good survived through flight school. Mm -hmm. And so if they made it through flight school, yeah. they, they were very good in They're what they did solid. there and stuff. Yeah. Um, worked with the Australians. Crazy, crazy people, mm -hmm. the Australians are. And they were, yeah. they were salt of the earth. They were, I loved working with them. Mm -hmm. and they mm -hmm. would work with the uh, mercenaries, the nuns and the, I um, can't remember what the other ones was, but mountain yards and mountain nuns yards, and stuff. They yeah. lived with them and stuff. Wow. These guys were, I mean, they were, they were fun people. Some of the ethnic minorities within Vietnam yeah. who mm -hmm. also allied themselves yeah. with, with you guys. And uh, so the Austies were very, very good. Uh, 
I'm trying to think who else we worked with. We were New, there there weren't many New Zealanders. Did you come across any New Zealanders? I don't know uh, if they I, were mixed in with the Aussies. I anyway. think they were. I mean, okay. we, we just kind of lumped them, I guess. You yeah. know, if you were from down that area, you were yeah. all from the same place. Kind of my yeah. ignorance, but anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Filipinos or Thai yeah. troops, any of that? Uh, sure. Filipinos, uh, not so much. Yeah. I, don't, yeah. I, I don't recall. I, I, they may have been with the army and been down south. I don't okay. know. Yeah, yeah. I'm actually not not sure about that. I know that they played a role in the war, but I'm yeah. not sure. I'm not sure why. Were you kind of implying a, a minute ago? Uh, this will be my last question on this. You know that the rocks. You know the troops from South Korea. They fought in this very tough way. It sounds like they did everything in this mm -hmm. very tough way. Um, didn't have a whole lot of interest in rules of war and things like that. Um, I don't know, maybe it's a bad question, but you know, when you watch their fighting style and you, then you saw you know, what the rules of engagement that you guys had, did it cross your mind that you know, if we actually want to win this war, maybe their fighting style is more effective? Yes. Really? Yes. Yeah. I did. Because of the region of the world and the style of warfare that existed in that world. Right. Yeah. It, it, uh, uh, yeah. It, I've always said, if you want to win a war, you know, every war we've ever actually won, we got meaner and lower and dirtier than the person we were fighting. In facts of life. And once we yeah. did that, we could win them. I mean, yeah. that's what happened, I think, in the Pacific and in, in World War II. I mean... Mm -hmm. You know, at least to some extent, that becomes a war without mercy, you know, on both mm -hmm. sides. And yep. Yeah. Well, that's an interesting, uh, it's not a happy observation, but it's an, <laughs> it's an interesting one. Yeah. It's and it's my thing. observation. I mean, uh, if you talk to another person, they're going to have a different take. Sure. So. Well, if you look at the, the reality of things, it makes some sense. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you, Mike. Okay. Thank you. Mike, tell us the story behind this photo. Uh, I came home on, <coughs> excuse me, coming home on leave from Vietnam on my way to uh, Jacksonville, Florida, uh, North Carolina. Anyway, my parents, this is my parents' house, and uh, they put that up there. I was uh, just come back from Vietnam. I'd spent uh, four or five days with a friend of mine that had got shot down. Um, in El Paso, mm. and then came from El Paso to Tulsa, and my mm. folks had that out there, and I thought that was that was pretty cool. Pretty nice. Yeah, pretty do you, nice. Do you think that was? Uh, I mean, this probably wasn't part of your plan, but do you think that was a good idea? You're back in the states to spend some time with a fellow combat vet before getting fully immersed back in the civilian thing again. Uh, you, understand, you understand what I mean? Like a lot of times, mm -hmm. like. Um, Vietnam vets will say I was in some rice paddy in Vietnam and three days later I was in some cornfield in Iowa mm -hmm. and it just seemed so yeah. surreal. Is that, you know, what do you yeah. think about I, that? I had uh, 18 months to go when I came back, so in I wouldn't like flushed right back in, oh, okay. in the Marine Corps to go, so I yeah. wouldn't like flushed right back into it. I but I needed that time in El Paso to decompose, I guess. Um, Dan Jones, uh, was a Marquette. We were Marquettes together. Uh, the, the, uh, everybody on his on his aircraft was killed. Ski oh, was the pilot, and Dan was the co-pilot. And, and Ski was we were all in the same Marquette class, oh. and they flying the 46s. Anyway, um, friendly artillery shot down. Oh. But anyway, uh, Dan and his wife uh, he was going through uh, rehab in El Paso. The Army. Like from physical injuries? Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, but he was like, had his own apartment and stuff. I mean, he could get around okay by that time. But I, I needed that time. It said I coming straight back into around family and stuff. Right, yeah. uh, my first night home, actually home, went to bed that night and I, and I, I couldn't, go to, couldn't go to sleep. And I'd get up and I'd walk around and then I'd go back to bed, and I'd go, something, something's not right. Yeah. And after I did that about three times, I noticed that between me and my door was where my uh, luggage was. 
And I'm going, for 13 months, you had nothing between your rack and the door because you got hit that night. You had to get out to the bunker. And so, I mean, it wasn't registering on me until I saw that, and I moved it, and I went back, I got in bed, and I went to sleep. Mm -hmm. So, but as far yeah. as the other, I think it helped me to be with Dan. Yeah. Uh, we, you know, we had, you know, some of the same friends and same people who went through flight school that didn't make it, and, mm -hmm. and those who did, and stories to relate between each other. He was yeah. a different squadron. And it gave me a t time to... Um, Decompose, I guess what I, I want to say yeah, the word yeah, on yeah. it and stuff. And what, was that intentional on your part? Like before I go see family, I want to. Well, I had made plans to see. The, the see, world. I did make plans to see Dan on the way because yeah. we landed in uh, San Ana. Well, it was San Ana flew out of Orange County, and um, I could stop off in. in uh, yeah. And in, uh, did a lot. A lot of your conversation with Dan was it about the war? Uh, yes and no. I mean, we talked about the good times, you know, I mean, a lot of good things, you know, we had good times even over there and stuff sure. and people we know and uh, uh, really at that time we didn't talk too much about our experience and stuff. Um, I asked him what had happened, you know, and he explained his part. And this uh, was a, a friendly fire incident you're yeah, saying. It's, yeah, again, when I was talking about uh, flying over, you had to call each fire base. And they were doing an external load of uh, water cans uh, going in on into the country, and it was there by Red Beach. And they had made their initial call at the first place to get clearance through. And each gun is supposed to have a plane spotter right by that gun and making sure there's no plane up there. Well, everything fell through the cracks. Oh, no. They made their call, they got their clearance, and uh, they got hit in the garbage cans, uh, not the garbage cans, the water cans. It flipped the bird upside down. Oh, okay. And they were trying to make it a split S out of it. And uh, they, they threw the uh, crew chief out immediately, the vibration and stuff. And when they hit, um, the gunner was dead. Uh, Ski and his armor seat went out. Dan and his armor seat went out. Dan got buried up to his neck in the sand. And, and then Ski had a broken neck and was killed. Oh. And so he said, uh, he said, Ski's dad, came to El Paso and talked to him. He wanted to know about it. You know, and you kind of have to, um, mm. sometimes you have to not point fingers or anything like that, but still, you know, tell what happened because wow. they're interested in sure. wanting to know. Yeah. Um, it's like um, when I got out of the Corps, um, I took a long way home and I went up to uh, the Boston area with another Marquette friend of mine. We were both got our wings the same day and served in the same squadron together. And um, he's from the Boston area. And <clears throat> being Emerson, which is Ralph Waldo Emerson's uh, great great grandson, mm. was uh, was with us. And we went through flight school together and stuff. And he was killed shortly after we came came home. Mm -hmm. So his family always just wanted to talk to anybody that. Uh, mm -hmm knew their son and was yeah. served with him and stuff. Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. Mm. Anyway, so we did. We went and visited with the, with the family. They're yeah. fantastic people. Um, they just wanted to know stories about their boy. And Bing was a, an exceptional uh, young man, yeah. very exceptional. Yeah. And um, uh, so those things, yeah, you know, I mean, they just want sure. to know, yeah. you know, how was my boy or, yeah. you know, and stuff and things. Sure. And, Looking back, I mean, do you think that that was um, a good thing to do rather, you know, to seek people out and, and to talk about things a little bit rather than just to try to suppress everything at the, uh, at the outset? I didn't think I went and searched people out other than, like I said, Dan, uh, right. uh, because we were really very close uh, going through flight school. Uh, Bing, his parents requested. Oh, they requested. They requested okay. yeah. uh, that we that Scully and I would come by and talk to him. Okay. And um, but as far as you know, saying, "Oh, I'm, I know your boy, and I want to go talk to you about him," you know, right? Uh, okay. No, yeah, none yeah, of that. You didn't, you didn't um, do that. Um, and you know, and, and you you know, as far as I'm job concerned, everybody did a good job, and and uh, but no, it's. Um, I didn't search it out if yeah. they were there, you know, yeah. and they ask. 
Sure. You know, they say, oh, I'd like to talk to you, okay. Sure. Well, you know, what what you. was your basic disposition? I mean, you know, let's say you, you had another 18 months to go in the Corps. Um, so that means you probably have a lot of interaction with other combat vets as well. Mm -hmm. um, I guess, yeah, I'm just interested in this, you know, some guys, their, their enlistment's up or their time is up. Mm -hmm. You know, they come, they leave Nam, they come out, or they come home and they're out of their military in three weeks. And all of a sudden, you know, they're in this completely, you know, mm -hmm. different world, the civilian world. Um, but you, it sounds like you, you had this opportunity to kind of ease back into civilian life. Mm -hmm. You're still in the Corps, but you're not in Vietnam mm -hmm. anymore. So, you know, kind of slowly getting introduced back to the civilian world. Did, does that, do you think that was right? That maybe in that uh, way you had a little bit of an advantage? Yeah, I would, I would really hated to try to come back and, and go straight back into civilian life. Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, we, we uh, North Carolina, what we did there was we were training brand new pilots to become combat co-pilots. Mm -hmm. And then we went on what's called the Caribbean cruise. We took a battalion afloat and, and was down the Caribbean stimulating what they would have over there. Sure. And stuff. So you're passing your stuff off. Um, we didn't really do a lot of interacting with our co-pilots. Mm -hmm. uh, not that we were above the everything. Yeah. But, you know, you, you always go, okay, these are the guys that I have, I have fought with. And this is who you stayed with. And a lot of them married, uh, still single. Um, and there was a lot of us single people too. Mm -hmm. And But, you know, you still had the military. You still had the danger of flying. You had the danger of flying a lord ship in, at sure. night and stuff. And so you still had the adrenaline there. Um, mm. But uh, I would have hated to have uh, gone straight from California home and then mm. floundered. Yeah, because, yeah. you know, a lot of them, and, uh, you know, you, you sit there, you got a paycheck coming in, mm -hmm. you got everything taken care of, you know, everything, stuff like yeah. that, and then all of a sudden, you're out there on your own, these guys, you know, yeah. they're, they're on their own, all of a sudden, they don't have a paycheck coming yeah. in, they don't have food three times a day, right, yeah. and all this stuff, and I mean, I can see where they would really be floundering. Just lost. I had 18 months to kind of go and okay and I, that's when I decided yeah I'm going to go back to school and I kind of sure. knew what I was going to do. Did you ever so, have any, any thought of, of staying in? And I, I did and I didn't. Um, not a good answer. Um, I did but I, I'd had enough of it. I, some of my friends did stay in. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought about the reserves, the closest uh, Air Reserve was Dallas for me when I came back uh, to Tulsa. Um, and I thought, you know, um, God's been very good to me. I don't need to push him don't anymore. Push him. <laughs> <laughs> I hear that. Yeah, that makes sense. So here's a, here's a photo. You come back to JBU and, um, you know, and I just, would, you know, in the, the photo, you know, the, the higher photo there, the longer one, uh, you're on the far right. So you've got these other JBU students, and I don't know uh, those other three guys. I'm guessing they didn't have any experience in, in no, Vietnam. Uh -uh. And uh, you came back. You were an assistant coach uh, of the mm -hmm. swim team, apparently. So there's a, there's a photo of you. And, um, you know, I just wonder about that because you're in Vietnam, you know, as we were just discussing, you've got this 18 months to, you know, kind of decompress a little mm -hmm. bit or ease your way back into the civilian world. But now you're back at, you know, little quiet Asylum Springs, Arkansas, JBU, mm -hmm. and students, these students being normal human beings of that age are complaining about whatever mm -hmm. they're complaining about. and, and I just wonder what was that like for you? I mean, having this third, not only not only the Marine Corps. I mean, just as an example. I mean, when I I started school after the Navy, right, in peacetime mm -hmm. Navy, I mean, complete total peacetime. But even then, I felt like I lived in a, a different world from all the other, mm -hmm. you know, the other college students I knew. For you, that's got to be much more pronounced. Mm -hmm. I mean, given everything that you experienced in Vietnam. So what was that like coming back to, 
you know, this place that you'd known before the war, mm -hmm. and you know, what what comes to mind when you think mm -hmm. about that? I, well, it wasn't just the the war; is uh, being a pilot and uh, stuff. I mean, we had tremendous amount of a lot of responsibilities and stuff, and you had yeah. command of, of a lot of things and stuff. Yeah. And so you come back, and it's very trifle. Uh, I, I remember standing there in the old Arkansas building, which isn't here anymore, but mm -hmm. uh, registering for classes, and two young, uh, probably freshmen or sophomores, and talking about, I don't know, like zits on their face or something, <laughs> you know, and I'm going, <laughs> You don't know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you don't know. So, and like you said, you know, we really didn't mix with the student body that much. Mm -hmm. uh, we had uh, some veterans, some that were uh, Vietnam veterans, some who were just peacetime veterans, but an older group. And of course, we migrated together mm -hmm. and stayed more together doing things together uh, yeah. like that. We played our um, intramural football team. It was yeah. made up of veterans, all except for one guy. He was, and we always called him the kid. And uh, we just did things together, and and we lived off campus, and we just didn't have that much interaction with the with the school. Uh, really, and so so the vets did kind of form yeah. their own their own mm -hmm. little world. You know, I just noticed the other day, you know, here on the John Brown University campus, um, a plaque that I had never seen before. And it's it's yeah, it's out in the quad, and I guess the plaque was put in place when a tree was planted, and it was in honor of um, veterans who had been lost in war. Really. But the but the date is 1969, and do you have any recollection of that, that mm -hmm. of a plaque that was set up on campus 1969? Because yeah, that would have happened before I got here. Okay, after you got you because yeah. you were still in the core. That's yeah. right, you were yeah. still in the core. But still, did you ever uh, remember seeing that? On but I don't. Mean, I came back here in '70, and I don't remember recall that. I, I'll have yeah, to go look I that was, up. I mean, I I had never noticed it before. I just saw it the other day. Yeah. Huh. Uh, planted there in 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 '69. So. Um, you know, in the in the photo that we just saw, we can go back to it. Here, you you have some some responsibility as the as the coach. I imagine it doesn't seem like very yeah. s serious responsibility yeah. compared to what you'd been yeah. through. And uh, Hub and White was. Um, I'm sorry, I, my wife told me don't talk over you. Oh, <laughs> and I apologize. Uh, uh, <laughs> Hub White was the the coach. He was the swimming coach and the water uh, polo coach. And um, he was gracious enough to have me as an, uh, let me be assistant coach. And it helped with, uh, I got paid for doing that. Right. That helped with the, with the GI Bill and the flying. Sure. And, um, but uh, Hub White was a wonderful person to uh, work under and uh, did very good with the, with the boys and mm -hmm. stuff. And so that was kind of nice, you know, I mean, he was, and he was an older guy and he respected veterans. Yeah. And the kid I was talking about, us veterans and stuff, is on the very far left-hand side, uh, Rick Bollinger. Oh, so he, he was a vet? No, he was not. Oh, he, he was the only one that was not the veteran on our little intramural team. All the rest oh, of them on I football see. teams. So that was a kid. We always called ourselves the over-the-hill gang and the kid. Uh, so uh, Rick was our kid. Uh -huh. and, uh, but anyway. Yeah. It's like Did, um, you know, the student body, knowing that you were uh, a Vietnam vet, do you feel the you know students saw you in a different way? I mean, obviously you're older, you're more experienced, and things like that. And of course, none yeah, of the protesting yeah, really made no. its way to JBU. But there was some that um, would throw their little remarks and stuff, and right. there was others who uh, was thankful and, and courteous, and then there was others that were clueless. Yeah, sure. I mean, literally clueless. They had their, I mean, by the end of the 70, 71, the, it was all starting to ground down. down. And um, uh, so you had some that were like, already had their career path set out and going to sure. grad school or doing yeah. this or that and stuff. Yeah. And, but then you had others who um, had issues. Mm -hmm. And then there was others who, um, Accept you, sure. You know, so kind so. of in a in a fairly small way, yeah. some of the divisions in the yeah. country did did show up here. Yeah. Oh, it did. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Did 
professors ever ever bring up uh, no bring the uh, up in classes? I'm trying to remember. I I don't remember having any issues with any of the professors mm -hmm. at all. I, the thing is, when I came back, my grade point was so bad that I had to be on the dean's list all three semesters to get my grade point up to graduate. Okay. And um, and I would go talk to the professors. I said, you know, I got to have an A in your class. What what do I need to do? Mm -hmm. and, you know, and they all would go bend over backwards to help me. And I'm going, what what a dummy! I said, why didn't I do this the first time? Why didn't I not go and talk to the professors the first time? Just go talk to them, you know. Mm. And that, so that's my biggest advice I have for students. I go, and go talk to your teachers. The, yeah. I mean, they want to help you, you know. Yeah, yeah. Gosh, I mean, it's important to finish your degree, but the, it must seem a little trivial compared to what you've been through. Yeah, and, and the only reason, I, not the only reason, but I, I wanted my degree was, it was, uh, it was kind of a little bit of a division you had a few people uh, in our squadron or even uh, on the East Coast that they had a college degree and they kind of looked down at you because you didn't have a college degree. Oh, okay. And so it was kind of like, well, okay, I'm going to get my degree. Sure. Yes, you know, because yeah. it's not that big. Even though we were equal, we did, you know, sure. everything and stuff and saying, yeah. but they just had that little bit of stuff that they were, yeah. they had a college degree. And I said, well, I'm gonna get mine, I'll get one and too. I'm that close anyway. So sure, yeah, might as well, might as well finish up. Let's uh, let's look at another couple photos. This is just the the top photo is a, is a photo that I took a couple years ago, and I was going through your photos, and you know I was in, uh, you know I visited uh, that part of Vietnam where you served, and I, I looked, I was looking at your photos and recognized what I think. Was Marble Mountain. I, so I think the bottom photo is looking at Marble Mountain from the north. So we're looking south, and then mm -hmm. the, the photo, the photo that I, I took is mm -hmm. is looking north. But I think we're looking at the at the same thing there. And so here's your photo. This is the Marine Base, right mm -hmm. north of north of Marble Mountain, there south of the city of Da Nang. And here's the photo I took, and um, before the camera started rolling. I, I believe this is Highway One, uh, you know, which runs the length mm. of Vietnam now, and, and that's that's what it looks like mm. now. Uh, what did Highway One look like when you were there? No, oh, it was just a almost <laughs> one step above a cow trail. I mean, it was yeah. dirt roads, uh, wow. bridges were non-existent, uh, and everything was was dirt. Uh, yeah. And so when you told me that, you know, we're looking at that, and I was going, my gosh, that's a super highway. <laughs> yeah, well, and if you keep going north about, well, I mean, once you get mm, maybe a half mile north of Marble Mountain, that's when the resort hotels start popping up all along the beach and so and, on. And that would be where, uh, if you're familiar with the old movies, not movies, but TV series, uh, uh, China Beach. Mm -hmm. was just on north of us right, right there right yeah. there and that I'm sure yeah. that's where the resorts and stuff right and stuff. Although, although I believe they call it holiday beach now oh, do they? Of the, the growing tensions with China they want to eliminate China yeah. from oh yeah so the the South China Sea they now call it the East Sea oh. and China Beach is holiday okay. beach and, and things like that would you have if you know if somebody said hey uh, just so happens that I have an all expenses paid trip to Vietnam and I can't go, I'll give it to you. Would you be interested in going back? Not really. No. Not really. I, I know a lot of the veterans that go back mm. and they say there's a lot of uh, closure. Mm. Um, I, 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 I think it would bother me to go back and see how modernized everything is. Yeah, why I is mean, that? Well, I don't know. It's kind of like, um, you know, and I'm yay for them, I'm glad for them. Yeah. But, um, I guess I wouldn't go back and see it the way I remembered and not what it is now. I always said if I did go back, I would love to be able to be left alone and my wife with me and rent a, an airplane and do my own flying mm -hmm. and fly back into the areas that um, mm -hmm. we worked yeah. and stuff. And especially, like I've said, you know, we go up by the rock pile and, and those areas and stuff right. and, and uh, see those, which you can't do, I don't think, you know, the way I would like to do it. And then, like I said, go and look at some of the, uh, the temples that are overgrown and, and things. I mean, like I said, there's pretty, pretty land there. But I'm going, I, I, uh, uh, I'm going, I 
don't think I would care to go back. And I don't care to go back mm -hmm. um, at all. Um, mm -hmm. The people are nice and stuff, but sure. I just don't care about going back there. I mean, I'm, I'm very well aware. I've been twice and plan to go back again next year. But I, I'm very well aware that what I see is not what you saw, obviously, mm -hmm. right? But, I mean, the Da Nang I saw is not the Da Nang you <laughs> saw. And even Marble Mountain, or uh, Marble Mountain, but also the Rock Pile, which you mentioned, I mean, is, mm -hmm. you know, is, you know, is something beautiful you see, you know, when you, mm -hmm. I think it's Highway 9, that, you know, you I take it so. from Highway I 1 so. uh, on the way out to Quezon, mm -hmm. and you can see the Rock Pile, and even though I read the stories of the rock pile and see photos of the rock pile from Vietnam, it's, it obviously for me is not the same thing. Is, and is, is, is that part of it that in a way, I mean, the Vietnam that you would see today, you know, it, 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 it actually isn't the, the place where you were, which is true. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. they've, you know, they're giving up the communist fantasy and they're joining the free market and you know the country is mm -hmm. on the rise economically and is, is that kind of what you're saying that in a way it's it's I mean it's not the same place anyway it, yeah it's um, I, I don't know how to explain it it's, yeah. it's kind of like I uh, uh, it's great that they're becoming more capitalists yeah you know I mean they're showing that that's what it was but how many people had to die to get to that point and I'm yeah. just not talking about uh, Americans. Right. I mean, this is, you know, when the communists completely took over that country, it was a bloodbath. Yeah. And, you know, how many of them that they put in these re-education camps and stuff, and to be able to get to the point that they're at now because of the, they found out that, you know, if they want to make and become modern stuff, this is what they got to do. Okay. And, uh, but I'm just going, I don't know if it would just be too much of uh, how many people had to pay the price for them to have this, I'm, I'm literally happy for them. Yeah. Well, I am, yeah. you know, and and I don't hold a grudge right. uh, against them. Right. But I just don't care. Uh, being reminded, I think is probably what it is. Reminded of the price, not in just our blood, but their own blood and sure. other, a lot of other people's blood, right. and uh, uh, the way it's going on today, you know. Just so. Mm -hmm. No thanks for the trip. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not a millionaire, so I won't be able to offer that to you. But. Well, um, I think before I ask about, we'll, 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 we'll come back to, to Christopher. Um, but, but before we talk about Christopher, there's a, just one other question I wanted to ask you. And that is, what advice would you have for, you know, we have troops in Afghanistan right now, and of course, Combat operations have wound down considerably, but you know there's some of this still going on. Um, what advice would you have right now for uh, a soldier, a sailor, marine, airman who experiences combat and uh, you know is is on the point of coming back home, right? What advice would you give that person about you know how to whatever the right word is, how to deal process, how to deal with process. I mean, you know what I mean? What, what advice mm -hmm. would you give a, a young combat veteran? Well, they have learned an awful lot, they as in the, the government, uh, about the veterans and stuff. And they, they still do it or not, but they basically have a mandatory week or two weeks of classes of when they come back yeah. for adjustment. Yeah. Um, counseling, PTSD, what have you and stuff. So they've made these gains <clears throat> and been there for a while and just till a few years ago when they started opening this up, uh, somebody would be afraid to even say, uh, Sarge, I've got a, a, I'm having a problem and stuff. Well, he would go on a list, he'd be blackballed, mm -hmm. you know, type stuff. And they've made that where, okay, you know, they want the people to come and ask for help. Yeah. Um, they didn't want to listen to us when we came back. They meaning the they veterans They is everybody. Sure. I mean, oh, everybody. Right, sure. You know, you'd go, they go, somebody, you know, friends, family, stranger, doesn't matter. And they go, well, tell me about Vietnam. And you're going, well, uh, what do you want to know? So, well, just tell me about it. And you start and they go, gee, look at the time I have mm -hmm. to go. I mean, mm -hmm. they didn't want to talk to you. Mm -hmm. they, they didn't want to hear it. We didn't want to share it. Um, we got to the point, it's hard to explain, but 
we go, they're not, they're not worthy of us telling them. Does that make sense? Yeah. You know, they're, they're not worthy. I mean, kind of the don't throw your pearls in from the swine yeah. kind of thing. And, you know? and so we went a, a many, many, many years before they actually realized that we have problems and they started trying to help us, but we're talking 30, yeah. 40 years mm. uh, before they even came to that realization. Now to ask to what your original question was, I would say make yourself available to all the counseling that you can get. Do not be afraid of what anybody else thinks. Go and get your counseling. Mm. And, and, and anything that's available to you in this counseling, sure. take it. Um, that would be my advice. Uh, sure. To, to take advantage of this. To talk mm -hmm. in some way. I mean, if, if you mm -hmm. find somebody in the civilian world who knows something about yeah. it, who really is interested, have conversations like this, and mm -hmm. you, you would recommend exactly. that. Because you can't yeah. share it with, um, uh, I, I, I feel like I was fortunate. I was not married. I, I feel very fortunate that I wasn't during that period of time. Um, why, why do you say that, that you feel fortunate? Uh, well, one thing, it was one less thing to worry about. Yeah. I didn't want to, no, I was being very selfish. I did not want to worry about anything going on back home, yeah. worrying about her welfare or any of that. Yeah. But I can see these people that, that come back and they're married and they can't talk to their wives. You know, they don't want their wives to know what they've seen and what they experience. You know, they, they, want, to sh they want to shield them yeah. from that. So yeah. they don't have anybody to talk to, Yeah. you know? So I'm just saying that, you know, just if you've got the, the counseling, uh, I got a mixed feelings on group therapy. Uh, some of us is probably good, some of it's probably bad. Mm. Uh, but uh, you can get the, the counseling, you gotta do it. Yeah. That'd be my, you know, my advice to them. Sounds like the underlying theme is just, you know, look for opportunities to talk mm -hmm. rather than suppress, yeah. I want to go, something else came to mind. I want to go back to something we were talking about a minute ago. Because um, you expressed a lack of interest in going back to Vietnam. But in, in different conversations, in a, a big event we had here at JBU, um, and then also in a, a class visit, you've said that, you know, in a way you've never left Vietnam. Correct. So... I wonder if you could put those two things together, like in, in a way you feel like you're still there, but you also, I mean, let, let, me, let me put it in the form of a stupid question. I mean, what about the idea of going back and bringing yourself home? Does that make any That's sense? A, I understand what you're trying to say. Yeah. Uh, a lot of us veterans are still there, like you're saying. Yeah. I've never thought of it in terms of going over there and bringing ourselves back. I know some guys who have gone, and they said that was their closure. Mm -hmm. I personally don't see that in my case. Yeah. I don't see that in my case. Yeah. Um, I think I'm probably the norm of people that are still there. Um, I mean, literally every day and literally every night and literally every experience that happens relates to something. And I don't think that would change uh, right. magically by just right. going there. Sure. It might, but I don't think it would. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because it's, uh, it's kind of like a, uh, a record and you're stuck in the 60s <laughs> in that groove. You know? Yeah. It's that kind of what it 68. is. And, uh, you know, and I told you just yeah. like uh, uh, flying and driving. And, you know, I like driving uh, here in town or going to Fayetteville or whatever. I, I see the tree lines and I start going to the map of the earth, I'm flying stuff. If there's a, a storm, I'm going back to when we had storms and we were still going out into it. Uh, uh, when my mom passed away in three years ago in St. Louis and uh, got a call in the middle of the night saying, if you want to you know, see her before she passed away, get up here. And I was in the middle of the night in my truck and there was storms ahead, the lightning and everything and stuff, and I was on my way to a medevac. I was on my way to a medevac. Wow. All the way up there, all six hours, was on my way to a medevac. Wow. And, and, and that's the way, uh, and I don't think I'm alone no. in this. Uh, you know, and other people have made uh, wonderful adjustments. Sure. And, uh, yeah. So anyway. 
if I had a, uh, if I could say I've, I've found uh, this magical potion, and if you drink it, all of that goes away, would you take it? No. You'd keep it? I would not. Um, that's an interesting deal, because I brought that up one time. Uh, I said, you know, if there was a, a way they could give you a shot or something, and it never happened. And would you do it? And the uh, majority of the people said no, mm. they would not. Mm. In my case, I'm going, um, I hate to keep dwelling on the people that aren't here, but, but it's kind of like, I don't want them forgotten. Mm. You know, I mean, oh, too bad, too bad, you're gone, forget you. Mm. And no, I don't want to dwell on them, I want to go on with my life, but I think it'd be a disservice if I forgot them. Mm. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. It does. I mean, to the extent that it can make sense yeah. to someone who didn't experience yeah. it. So, mm-hmm. um, to be blunt, no, I would not. Even though it would give me a lot of peace. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. But yeah. I'm just going, yeah, not No, that's, them. I mean, I've, yeah. I've, that's usually the, the response. I mean, there's, I, long time ago, I had a conversation with a LERP, you know, an Army mm-hmm. long, yep. long range reconnaissance guy. Serious problems with Agent Orange, which I think accounted for his death at a pretty young age. And uh, this topic came up, and he said, you know, Vietnam destroyed my life. I think he mainly, speaking of Agent Orange, um, Vietnam destroyed my life. But um, and the way he put it is, but I would do it again. Exactly. And you understand that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. The old saying is, I wouldn't... Uh, I wouldn't take a million dollars for it, but I wouldn't do it again, mm. you know, type thing. But yeah. I would, you know, I, I'm glad I had the opportunity. Yeah. I'm, I'm fortunate that there was that time and place in our country, but uh, the experience and everything else, I wouldn't give anything for. I mean, I, I would not take a million dollars for that. I, that's mine. But if they come yeah. up and says, here, a million dollars, do it again, <laughs> I'm going, yeah, let's talk about oh, this. Right. Oh, okay, so <laughs> I get it. Let's, let's talk about this. Someone now, I don't says, know I'll give you a million bucks and all this goes away. No. To you, that's not worth no. it. Uh-uh. Yeah, yeah, very interesting. Well, let's look at this, uh, this photo here. And, and Christopher has, has the same last name that you do. So tell us about Chris. Uh, Christopher was a cousin on my dad's side. Um, I did not meet Christopher. Uh, he was from Mangum, Oklahoma. He uh, was 19 years old when he was in the Marine Corps. And he checked into uh, Vietnam May 1 of 1968. Mm. And it was either May 18th or May 19th, somewhere in there. He was killed wow. over there. He was only there 18 days. Wow. And he was on uh, the road just south of Hill 55. And uh, uh, I checked my logbook and to see what I was doing on that day, and I was flying and supporting the units around Hill 55 and out of Hill 55. Mm. So, and I was doing medevacs and I was taking out the uh, KIAs also that day. And I've often wondered, you know, maybe I took Christopher's body out, and wow. I've always going, I well, I feel like I did because it's family helping family. And um, Nell and I have gone back to Mangum, Oklahoma, and looked up Christopher's uh, grave there. Mm. And, um, and then, of course, Christopher's on the wall. Sure. So. Yeah. And you've, you've been to the wall yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And Chris is there. Well, Mike, I really appreciate you uh, having these discussions with us. Thanks very much for sharing. Thank you, appreciate sir. Appreciate it. All right. Thank, thank you. you.